Shalom Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research and I have just an incredible message I want to share with you tonight. It's very much in line with the type of things when God reveals to me about Yeshua being hidden in, in, the, in the, uh, the Torah, the Tanakh, in the writings of the prophets, the stories there. And now he's given me one from the New Testament. Uh, from the writings of Paul, no less, and it's actually inspired by a comment, excuse me, that a brother um, uh, left, and, and no doubt he meant well, but he, he left one from Galatians uh, chapter 1, verse 8. So if you got your Bible, you want to follow along with me, I'll try to be putting these scriptures up for you as well. But God began to deal with me on this here, just like he does with Yeshua, hidden throughout all these wonderful scriptures. Like, you know, for example, when I talked to you about the, the crown of thorns that he wore and how that it was just like when God spoke from the midst of the bush with Moses. Remember in Hebrew, the Sinai, uh, Mount Sinai, that's, that is a thorn bush. The word Sinai is a thorn bush. And we see Yeshua was in that midst of that thorn bush. And and so many things, when his side was pierced, he was that rock being smitten and the waters come out. Uh, and as God has revealed to me those things there, now, for one of the first times, he began to deal with me about Paul's writings as well. And Galatians happens to be one. Uh, if you are a person that has been following, though, teachings on equality in other circles, you're going to find this interesting because... It's hidden right in here, right before your eyes. Not even hidden, it's just laying there in the book of Galatians, but perhaps it's not a place that you thought that Paul was writing about equality, but he is. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 1. We'll begin with verse 5. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Hmm. which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and pervert the gospel of Christ. That being the gospel that Yeshua brought. But though we, now watch carefully what Paul here says, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that which, which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So, he's, there's a problem going on in the congregations. They're, they're already moving away from the gospel that Yeshua brought. And now Paul challenges, he says, but though we, in other words, the Christians, those that are believers in Christ, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, which we have preached, excuse me, preach any other uh, gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which, than, than that you have received, let him be accursed. Any man. And I know that when the person left the comment on there, they were trying to say that we weren't saying what Paul actually said. So just bear with me here. Watch what Paul says here. Verse 10, for do I now persuade men or God? Hmm. Or do I seek to please men? For if I pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Remember now, Paul comes from the strictest of Orthodox Judaism, a Pharisee. And as a Pharisee, he believed in the oral law. What we would call today as Jews, the Mishnah or the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud or the Babylonian Talmud, all of it's the same. It's what was considered to be the oral law that's been passed down. Now, it's really totally contradictory to Torah. So I do not believe that this was the oral law of Moses at all. But now, is there some things maybe that's written in there that could be useful? Certainly there is. It's just like in Christianity. All the teachings that people say are teaching about what Paul said or, or, or Yeshua said or were teaching about what was written in, in the, uh, in, 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 in the uh, Tanakh, the Torah. When people make commentaries, they're just like the sages that wrote what they call the oral law because it's rabbis' opinions. It's not really the oral law. There was, there was not a law like that. Uh, but anyhow, way. I mean, not to say that it wasn't because they wrote it down, but the point is, it's not what Moses was saying is my point on that. 
So he's saying here, for do I now persuade men or God? So in other words, there's men that are really stuck in the Pharisaic traditions. And that could easily be against women that are wanting Paul to teach the same. And we're going to get into this very deeply. I should not... Uh, or, or do I seek to please men? For if I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So Paul's not here to please you. And I, and I have to be quite frankly, brother, sister, I, I'm not here to just make people feel good. I, I, if you have itching ears, I'm not here to tickle your ears. I'm here to tell you what's truth. And believe me, what I'm going to say tonight, just as I have said in the past, when I begin to make these stands for what the Word of God actually says, there's people that lose, they walk away. They say, I won't support this ministry. And I'm not afraid of that. Because I must stand for the word of God. I'm not here to be a, a man pleaser. I'm here to try to help you to see what is the truth. So please bear with me. I beg you, brothers, bear with me in this. And sisters. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached uh, of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it by the, by the revelation, but, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he's not teaching you what that oral law is. For you have heard of my conversations in time past in the Jews' religions, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Because it didn't line up with what he thought was right. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. That's how you know he's talking about the Talmudic, what we would call the Talmud today or the Mishnah, the oral law. He's telling you now he was more zealous of the traditions of my fathers. And believe me, I, I'm still a member of the Chabad uh, uh, Orthodox Jews of today. I know exactly. You go into one of our synagogues in the Orthodox uh, Chabad community, and they're, and they're wonderful people. They love God. They really do. I have, I have a heart and a love for my people. But men sit on one side. We have, a, we have a little wall there, and women sit on the other side. It's tradition. It's not God. It's tradition. He said, so he goes on to say, verse 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, he didn't go by the traditions anymore, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went up to Arabia and returned again into, into Damascus. Then after three years, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Okay, now, here's what I want to first talk to you about, because we have to break down what's being said here. Let's back up. Let's look at that verse 8 again. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel. Well, what is the word gospel? What is gospel in Greek? Because this is what this, the New Testament was written in. The word gospel, if you define it, it means to announce good news evangelize, or evangeli in, in Greek, especially the gospel, declare, bring, declare or show glad tidings. To preach the gospel is to show or to declare glad tidings or good tidings. Now, he says here in verse 7, which is not enough, well, let me back up verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. If the gospel is, is declaring, or, or, or notice what it says, the gospel is to declare glad tidings. And then he says, verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So what was the gospel of Christ? What is the good tiding that Yeshua brought? You know, the clearest way to see this is if we go to um, let me just share this with you. I want to take you to Luke chapter 4 in verse 16. Uh, and I didn't finish Galatians. I want, to, I want to take it all the way down to the end uh, in just a moment here. 
It says in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, speaking of Yeshua, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Do you know that when Yeshua came, do you know when he actually read this, do you realize that it was actually a jubilee year? When he did this, this is when every man, woman, and child that had been sold into slavery could go free. He came to set at liberty. He came, as he said, to he, had, he was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. What was the gospel? It was a gospel of what? Deliverance to the captives. Even the women had become captive to what? To the oral traditions of the Pharisees. And they were held in bondage. Yeshua, when he goes down to the woman at the well, and he tells her, bring me a drink. And she says, sir, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We have, any, we have no customs with each other. He first breaks down that wall of separation. And he says, if you knew who was talking to you, you'd ask me for a drink, and I would give you water that you don't have to come here anymore. She gets into a little argument with her, and he finally says, go get, he says, uh, or, or a debate, and he, she says, he says to her, go get your husband. She says, I have no husband. He says, you've told the truth. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours. She said, I perceive you're a prophet, for we know that when Messiah comes, this is what he'll do. Now, I'm just paraphrasing this one for you. And he said, woman, I am he, the one that speaks to you, I am. He, he says, I am that Messiah. He claims to, he says, he's letting her know, I'm that Messiah. Now she takes and breaks all the traditions of the men of that day, and she runs into the city and tells everybody, come see a man who's told me everything I ever did. She's preaching the gospel of Yeshua. She was set free she was set at liberty and she goes and preaches that gospel and the bible says that the men of the city believed because of her testimony and they came out and of course it's funny though they come out and when they hear hear him they said now we not believe not just because of you but we believe because we heard it from him kind of going right back into that same tradition again but nonetheless they first believed and they were converted because of her own testimony it's interesting isn't it you know, there's many places in the Bible, like, for example, even Mary Magdalene actually wrote a book that should have been canonized in the Bible. But, of course, when they begin to suppress women again and burn them at the stake for being witches because they were spiritual, uh, that all went by the wayside. There's strong evidence that supports that the book of Hebrews was actually written by a woman as well. There's even uh, Junia. I think it's Junius that you call in the New Testament there that's called an apostle. The name was changed to a man's name, I think in the 14th century by the Roman Catholic Church when it was actually a woman's name, but they didn't want anybody knowing that it was actually a woman apostle. A lot of these things are there. Now, I'm going to be sharing with you some specific things here, but let me just bring this back to you. So the gospel that Christ brought, and he quotes it from Isaiah 61, he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. And recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. He closed the book. He gave it again to the minister and sat down in the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue, were fastened to him and began to say, and he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He'd come to set them free. Now, you know he only read half of verse 2, what we call verse 2. 
Let me read to you from Isaiah 61 so you can hear right from, from there. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Liberty. Who are the captives? The women. The men were not captive. But also the captivity is the fact that Satan had us captive. See, there's a twofold meaning in this. When you say that set at liberty of the captives, it's not just the women that were captive according to tra 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 tradition, but it's also men as well. Because why? Satan had us captive and we had become his bondsmen because why? We had not received the Holy Spirit. As I said about the woman at the well, he said, if you knew who it was that was talking to you, I'd give you to drink. You wouldn't come here anymore. Inside of Christ, that new birth that we needed was that tree of life that was within him. And when he was crucified on Calvary, his side was opened up. Just keep, keep this in mind. Why was, his, why was he put into a deep sleep to begin with or death? Why did he die? He had to, do, he had to fulfill what Adam messed up on. See, Adam was put into a deep sleep as well. And when, and, and in this case here, Adam was not just Adam, he was, uh, he was from Adama, from mankind. In the Greek language, it's literally, when they translate that word, it's for mankind. Adam was both man and woman, and Eve was inside of Adam, and God taken and opened up that side. And, and even in the Orthodox Judaism, it looks to us from what we can see that's reading, written in Genesis, he taken half of his side and opened it up and made and formed woman from that, Isha. She was called Isha, which is the fire of Almighty God in a body. And Adam was Ish, a fire of Almighty God as well, the Spirit of God living in these two beings. And he closed up that side of Adam, and he healed him. He brought him back normal, brought him out of that deep sleep. And then when the sin came, they forfeited the tree of life for their children. So Christ had to come to fix the mistake that Adam made. Because Adam, with his eyes open, sinned against God. Eve, Eve sinned in ignorance. Isn't that interesting? Even in our, even in our offerings that we offer to God back in the times of, of, of the offerings, if you sinned in ignorance, you brought a female, a female lamb for an offering, testifying that Eve sinned in ignorance. In fact, who, who corrected her mistake? She disbelieved God's word, so God had to find someone who would believe her word in order to bring forth the word again, and it was Mary that believed. Mary literally fixed a mistake that Eve made. Eve doubted God's word. Mary believed God's word. No wonder why it says, the woman's seed. But nonetheless, when his side was opened up, that water came out of his side, just like the water from the rock that was smitten in the wilderness. And that was the life of God that was to come back inside of us. So this is where it's at. The set at liberty, or excuse me, um, going back to it here, to, 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 to proclaim liberty to the captives. Because we were captive. We needed liberty. We needed to be set free so that we could receive the life of God inside of us. But that was man and woman. Because Satan had pulled us into bondage. And even under false doctrines, he'd pulled us into bondage. And so, sisters, you're free. You are free today. You do not have to be in bondage under false doctrines any longer. You know, when he stopped right there, he said to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And he, he laid down that, that scroll and he said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He didn't read the next part of it. And the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all that mourn, that's about to be fulfilled. Vengeance is coming soon. Moses will bring that along with Elijah and Christ will comfort them that mourn. Mm. So anyway, let's go back. I, want to, I just want to take you back just a minute to Galatians. And let's review this just a little bit more again. Notice what he says. I marvel that you so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and you would pervert the gospel of Christ. 
There's no more, there was no more preaching of setting at liberty. Now it was to bring the people into bondage again. There was no more deliverance. So he says, but though we, that's those that are claiming to believe the message of Yeshua, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Now, ironically, out of all the people that have written in the New Testament, Paul knew that someone was going to change what he brought to the people as a message. And he said, though we, in other words, from our own brethren, change this, if you change it, or even if an angel from heaven comes and changes it, because why? That angel has anointed you to believe a lie. Don't think they can't say, God can't send a lying spirit. He did it before. God said, who can I get to, to go down and deceive Ahab? And a lying spirit come up and said, I can get him and all the prophets with him to, 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 to believe a lie. And he got into Jezebel's prophets and they all prophesied in one accord. And Elijah was the only one that stood there and stood against all of that nonsense. So yes, an angel from heaven, a lying spirit can come and get in amongst the people and pervert the gospel that Paul brought. And they did. They changed the meaning and the words that he spoke and they put women back in bondage. And even the early church fathers are no different. The people they call the early church fathers, many of them are just like Pharisaic Talmudic believers. They quit preaching what Paul preached. Nowhere do you see Jesus put the women in bondage. Nowhere. You show me where Jesus says, women, keep your mouth shut and don't speak. He's the one that sent them out to speak. He tells when he res resurrected from the dead, he tells Mary, go tell my disciples I'm risen. Oh, wait a minute. I thought Paul said that a woman is to be silent in the church. Well, man, he, she's going right where the church is. The church was in the houses and she's going there and, he, and Christ gave her the commission to do it. You think Paul's going to teach something contrary to that? I'm, I'm going to get into it, brothers. Please be patient with me. I'm fixing it. To, I'm going to take you and prove to you these things. I'm going to prove it to you, but I'm trying to get you to understand there's another gospel. And Paul knew that his words were going to be perverted. Of all the people, it was Paul's words that were going to get perverted. Not all of them, but, but enough to bring the women back under bondage because that's what Pharisees liked. You have to remember those early church fathers that began to rise up. Even Peter had, had a, you know, he, he's God kept him. But you can go back to the Clementine writings, which are the early Greek writings that are just about what was going on during that time. People that wrote books and stuff that, uh, about that. And, and, and Dr. Hutt, I know Dr. Hutt from Nebraska University. He's a, uh, a Greek scholar. And he'll tell you, I've sat there, I've interviewed him before. And he'll tell you, in those writings, they wrote about Jesus, they wrote about Paul, and they all talk about they were the most liberal teachers of their day. They were said, they said women were preaching the gospel. On Paul, the people, the women that followed Paul were preaching the gospel. They said Jesus did contrary to the customs. Women were always following him. We see that everywhere written in the gospels. Women were always following Jesus. That was not, that was forbidden. They were supposed to be separated. Not women with the men. That was, that was wrong to do. That's why when Jesus' apostles come up, when Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, and, they, and the Bible says they didn't dare ask him, why are you speaking to this woman? Because it was contrary to their custom. But he had set at liberty these women. So we don't find it. It's the only place you find it that it seems to be that Paul's the only guy going around preaching against women. Or perhaps those ones that came from the first Pharisaic law, as Paul said, though we, they were part of that. And Paul even talks about the grievous wolves that entered in among you. He said, they'll pervert the gospel after my departing. Yes, they wanted to put women back in bondage. So a lot of the early church fathers say the same things like the Talmudic ones do. They talk about how women should be shut up, not talk, not speak, or anything else. And by the way, the Catholic Church endorses all the early church fathers, and a lot of the denominational Christians do as well, and that's what they're using to bring all of these denominational ministers back into the Catholic Church is by the early church fathers. All of them that hated the Jews, hated women. Some of them say women shouldn't even speak. Oh, gosh, I won't even get into that right now. Mm. 
They're, they're really nasty on there. But anyway, then he goes on to say, let's look at it again. As we said before, so say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have received, let him be accursed. So all those ones that changed Paul's writings here in all these books where they say that women are to be shut up, him, now notice that's what he said too, him, let him be accursed because someone changed it. All it took was one man, one translator to pervert it. Let him be accursed. Because why? He put all these women that Christ come to set free, he put you back in bondage again. Now, Christ didn't put you back in bondage, but that one accursed man that did it. And Rome was the one that put this together. At, at 325, when they put the Bible together, and they began to teach it, you weren't allowed to have a Bible anymore then. Not the, not the true believing Jewish believers, though. Not the early Gentiles, Christians that really loved the Lord. Not the early women that were Gentile women that believed. They're Jewish women as well that believed. They knew they were free. But they had to silence that. That's why we had that Inquisition. That's why the, the Inquisition wasn't just against the Jews. It was against the women as well. Murder every one of them they could. Even in Europe, as I've been in Europe uh, here recently, you go, you go into Europe there. Let me tell you something. I, I've been to towns where every single woman in the village was murdered as a witch. Thanks to the Catholic Church. And, the, and ministers want to go join that back up. It's beyond me. So he says, for do I now persuade men or God? In other words, am I going to stick to the traditions of the fathers and make you happy? Or do I, or do I make God happy? Or do I seek to please men? For if I please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For neither I received it him, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Christ. For you have heard of my conversations in time past in the Jews' religions, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Let's jump down to verse 20, because this is the part I didn't read. I wanted to finish this up. Now, the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, Cilicia, it was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ, but they had, had heard all only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in. Brother, sister, listen. Now, now I want to take you to some of the examples that we're dealing with on this. We set the stage now. Now you know that what the gospel is, is to set at liberty. That's what Christ brought. Isaiah 61, we found that in Luke chapter 4, where he actually reads this. This is what Paul came to do. He came to preach the same thing. But here's a good example. And I'm only going to give a couple of examples tonight, because I know this video is already long. But... I'm bringing these back up, and believe me, in every single one where you see that it appears that Paul preaches against women, every one of those have been perverted. 1 Corinthians. And let me say this before I bring this out as well. Do you know, recently, uh, and I believe this is in um, Exodus, uh, in the book of Exodus, and, and I brought this to your attention not too long ago, where it speaks about Moses. And Moses, God gives him a promise that he would do greater miracles with him. Now, he's already crossed the Red Sea. He's already did all the plagues in there. And God said, I'm going to do wonders, wonders that will be greater than anything that you've done before. And he said, I'll, and he's going to bring that vengeance. God is going to bring judgment with Moses. But because Moses died, and of course the rabbis they just assume, they don't know that he's coming back. They, they don't believe the teachings uh, of John and Revelation that there's two witnesses coming and one has the same gifts as Moses. So they just assume that we need to retranslate this word to something else. It's written plainly. It's written right here in my Torah. And I have, a, I have an interlinear linear one. And of course, I understand Hebrew well enough. I see when they make mistakes in here. But, but the thing is, is... They're, they're taking Moses' words, and they, they honestly, they just tell you, they said, because he died and he never did anything greater, so it must mean this instead, and they changed the meaning of the word in English. 
This is how all these scruples have gotten done down through the years for whatever purpose it is. Now, they're just doing it because they're honest. They just, they don't see it. But in a lot of cases, it's for the agenda because they want to keep the Talmudic traditions. So let's look at Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. This is one, one of the very good examples right here where it is all scrupled up. And Paul's words have been changed, though we, as he said, or an angel from heaven come and preach any other gospel than that which I have preached. Let him be accursed. And so they took, and they knowingly, they knew what they were doing. Verse 34 used to be in a margin as a question that was being asked Paul. But guess what? They finally later, Rome put it right there in the column to make you think that he's just preaching a gospel to put women in bondage. Watch what it says. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Hmm. Verse 35, And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, originally, and I've showed you guys an example of this before. Hopefully, if I can find it, I'll put it in this video as well. From that, where you can see, whereas in quotations, they were asking him the question. They're actually asking him about this. But we don't get to see both sides of the letters. But in the ancient, some of the ancient manuscripts, you can see that. And that's what I pulled up was one of the ancient manuscripts. So you could see that where they had put that in like a margin or a quotation there for you. So that was actually being a question that was being asked of Paul. And then, of course, Paul then responds back and he says, What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? See, he's challenging them. They're telling that the women are to remain silent. They're asking the question, you know, the, the, the issue's being brought up, that let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted to them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. In other words, they're reminding Paul, because why? Paul has got away from the traditions of the elders, or, or from the elders of his time frame. He got away from that. So they're bringing that to his memories. Don't you know, in other words, Paul, this is being taught. You know, that the women are to keep silent and they're to ask their husbands at home. Don't you know that, Paul? That's what they're saying to Paul. Don't you get that, Paul? And we know this because like in the time when Paul comes back and they ask him, they say, Paul, you know, you're coming back to Jews. You know, you need to, to, to do the traditions that we have. You know, the washing is of your hands. And, and even it was of an offering of a sacrifice that, that was part of that tradition. And Paul submitted for the sake of his own people. But when it come to this here, he wasn't going to submit to put the women back in captivity. So he asked that question. He says to them, what? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? In other words, the traditions, did they only come to you? Or did we not have a written Torah that God gave Moses? Yes, we have a written Torah. And it doesn't say that in the written Torah. So he says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandment of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. So now he's answering it. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Now, who knows what the issue was? Maybe it was an issue of speaking in tongues, but he's, telling, he's kind of even correcting it. Covet the or be more earnest about prophesying. Why? Because he knew the example from the Torah, from the, or from the Tanakh, Huldah the prophetess. He knew that Miriam was a prophetess. And God even said himself, what did God say? God said, I sent unto you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Are you serious? God sent a woman? Yes, he did. And God says it. It's written in the law. No wonder why God sent Mary to speak to her apostles, or to his apostles, excuse me. Excuse me. Amazing, isn't it? So anyway, now let's first take a look at this, though. If, if you want to look at the part about the question. So he says in verse, th for, chapter 14, excuse me, verse 14, uh, chapter 14, verse 34, Let your women keep in silence in the churches, for it is not permitted to them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. Now, in the King James Bible, 
I looked at the references for this, and they take you to, of all places, Genesis 3.16. I love this one. So they take you to Genesis 3.16. All right, now let me just read to you Genesis 3.16. El Haisha Omar, Harba Arabe, Itzabonecha, Ve Haranecha, Be Tzav. Tell a daibanin, Ve El Ishach, Tushutecha, Ve Hu Imashal Becha. Now, I'll translate. I'll translate to you the way King James translates this, okay? Because this is the reference for women to remain in silence. I will put, uh, excuse me. It's funny. And to the woman he says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, for one, I see nothing in there, I mean, clearly the law was given to Moses, but even, and we know Moses wrote Genesis though, but, but that's the only source that they give is Genesis 3.16, that she's to remain in silence is also said at the law. Does it say anything about a woman remaining silent? Now I'm going to help you to understand though what this actually says, because this is mistranslated as well, just like you have in, in, in the other part there. Uh, but now, when I say mistranslated, Keep in mind, Genesis 3.16, if you go all the way back to when the Bible, the, the, the Tanakh was written in Greek, they didn't translate it the way you have it now either. And that was 200 BCE, before, or, or before Christ, BC. They even translated it different. Why do they translate it this way now? Well, they got to keep everything going in continuity with what Paul taught, and that's women being under obedience, as also saith their law. All right, now is there a law? Yes, and for those, I've told you before, it's a Talmudic law, but I'm going to post it on the screen for you because I'm sure there's been many of you guys that have actually asked me, Brother Steve, what is that law? So, all right, I'm going to give it to you finally. I'll be kind enough this time. <laughs> so, all right, so anyhow, let's go to, let's go to the actual law. And this, uh, you can find this... Um, if you want to look it up uh, to, be, to be as well, it's in the Talmud. It's under uh, Tracte Kedushin. Um, Kedushin, excuse me. Tracte Kedushin. You'll see it on the screen here. And it says literally, it is a shame for a woman to let her voice be heard among men. Now, you got to remember when the Talmud was written, it was 400 years after Christ. They didn't get it exactly the same way that Paul knew it, but you have to remember during Paul's time, it was all oral tradition. Now, could they have had something written down at that time? I have no idea. Maybe, maybe not. But nonetheless, as they did, we did take, the Jewish people did put the oral law into a written format. It was first done with the Mishnah, which was done about 200 years after Christ, and then later the, the, we had the Babylonian, the Jerusalem Talmud. Jerusalem Talmud, by the way, was not written in Jerusalem, because naturally we were already into exile, but it's what we call it. And, um, and, and these three different books are, uh, are what we call the oral law. Now, we have some other ones as well that are, that are just as bad when it comes to being against women, but it's not written by Moses. It's not written in the Bible. But as I show you, a woman's voice is prohibited because, uh, excuse me, it is a shame for a woman to let her voice be heard among men. You see why Jesus was totally contrary to them? Jesus sends Mary to go say to his apostles, tell them, I have risen. He speaks to the woman at the well, and she goes in the city and tells all the men. But yet, according to Jewish Orthodox tradition, her voice is not to be heard among men. How could we ever come up with such stupid traditions as Jews when clearly we had the examples of Huldah, the prophetess, when the king had to, even the, even the high priest said, go get Huldah and find out the word of God so we will know what to do. Are you serious? I thought a woman's word was not to be heard among men. Many other examples I can give you. That's just some of those, you know. Um, Another one in the Talmud, in, in Berchot Kedoshim, it says, the voice of a woman is fil filthy nakedness. Now look at, look at the early church fathers and look at what they teach against women and you'll find out what is it. It is Pharisaic, Talmudic, Mishnah thinking 
people that had converted to Christianity, but they did what? They brought another gospel. In other words, they did not want to have you set free. They wanted you in captivity. So, it's actually being a question is being asked there in Corinthians there. But, uh, but Paul goes on to say, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are to be the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Okay? Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and to forbid not to speak with tongues. All right. Now, so let's go back, though, to Genesis because it's really important that we bring this out as well because they're citing Genesis 3.16 to actually be the, the law where women are to remain silent. Okay? So I've got with me my Torah, nice, pretty, and in Hebrew there, and we're going to look at this. El ha'isha omer. And to the woman, uh, he said, and Isha, remember, that's so beautiful. Isha, ha'isha. You know, Adam changes her name. And I have to thank uh, Edith, uh, Sister Edith Neumeyer. Neumeyer. And, and by the way, I, I hope we have her message up uh, by Tuesday, um, Tuesday or Wednesday, something like that. I'll be working on the editing of that as well. Uh, wonderful sister in the Lord there that God has really blessed with understanding. But anyway, uh, she, she mentioned something we were recording together, how that Adam changed her name. He kept the name Adam but he changed her name, see, to Chava, Eve, robbing her of humanity. And it's something she said, and I really thought that was a beautiful expression. God bless our sister. Anyway, it says, El Haisha Omer, Harobe Aroba, Itzavonecha. Now, as I've mentioned to you before, when you guys get this translation, you're actually reading this as, um, um, and to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. But in Hebrew, that's not what it says. And let's look at this. Now, there are some ancient manuscripts that actually translated the part about the, I will greatly multiply. They translated it as the one that is lying in wait. And it's, it's very difficult um, and like I said, that's some of the ancient manuscripts in the translated, they, they translated that as the one that's lying in wait. Because why? When, you, when you're looking at this here, it is literally rendered as lying in wait. Instead, it, it is rendered, you know, the way we have it now is, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. The difference between the two Hebrew words that you're looking at there lies wholly in the interlineal vowel signs. And I know that's deep for me to even say that, but... In the book of Joshua, for example, I think it's in chapter 8, if I remember right, eight times alone in the word in, the, in, in chapter 8, the same word here, the, the, the root of the word, which is uh, uh, rabbah, or rabbe, however you want to pronounce that there, because it's, it's being done two different ways. The root of that word literally means ambush. Now, it's translated 14 times, either as ambush or snare, or, the, or the, the one lying in wait in other parts of the Bible. So that's why in some of the ancient manuscripts, they had actually translated that as the, the snare, or the one that's lying in wait. Um, so in, in reality, what you're looking at here is it should be, it should be translated as, um, so it actually should be re uh, read here. Uh, more along the lines of, a liar in wait hath increased thy sorrow, or, or the one that has ambushed you uh, hath increased thy sorrow. Now, even the word sorrow, um, you have to understand here, this is another issue here, and that is the word that they're saying, conception. Now, the King James writes that as conception instead of sorrow. That, that, uh, that is, that is in, let, me, let me go back to the King James here real quick. Hang on, bear with me. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And it's actually uh, the one lying in wait uh, or the one that has ambushed you uh, shall increase your sorrow and sighing is actually what it is. Now, the reason we know this is because the word here, and this was also, by the way, 
if you go back to the second and third century, uh, and I believe that's the Septuagint when the Bible was written in Greek, they changed, they translated that word at that time, uh, which is vecharonecha, uh, they translated it as sign, not conception. And we, it's obvious even for me, because if you look in the book of Ruth, uh, the book of Ruth in chapter 4, verse 13, in the spelling of conception, you have to add a yod and a vav. Then you have the word conception. Now, if it was just one of the, one of those two letters, and I, I kind of stopped for a second because I know that you guys may not understand this, a yod and a vav can also be vowel letters. But let's say it had just been a vav, it's just one extra letter. All right, well, then we might say, yes, it was conception. But the problem is, is we already know in the second and third century they were translating the word as sign, not as conception, but as sign. And so the problem is, though, is we have two letters there for the word conception in the book of Ruth, a yod and a vav. And you're not going to have two vowel letters here, so one is definitely being used as a consonant in, in that regards there in the book of Ruth for the word conception. So clearly, in Genesis, vecharonecha is not the word conception. That has been suggested that it should be that, but it's not correct. So, what, but why did they do that? They moved away. Why? Because of Talmudic traditions. Because of oral law traditions, just like the church has done the exact same thing. See, the church got more in harmony with the Pharisees. Why? Because they were bringing back that Pharisaic law to put the women back in bondage. So they got in, they got in great lining with that, and so they could both work together. That's why they could use Jewish scholars to help translate, and then they kind of alter some of these things here so you wouldn't really know the truth. But it's actually the one that is lying in wait hath caused your sorrow and your suffering. Okay, that's what he says there. Be'etzav, be'etzav taladai, and in pain or in grief. That word there is actually like grief and you know, in sorrow. You shall bear taladim banim. You're going to birth sons. God is prophesying to Eve. He's telling her, and you really got to look at verse 15 because that's really where, the, you know, in, in Genesis here, it's not just verse 16, it's in verse 15 too. You know, that's where we have, um, uh, let me read to you verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. You see, the whole thing is between Satan and the woman. That's why when you go into verse 16, it's not God causing her this, the, it's not God multiplying her her with pain and she, God is going to cause her to have children and stuff. It's the one that has deceived her. The one that she said, the serpent beguiled me. The one that, the serpent deceived me. And so God says, the, in other words, the one that has deceived you, he is going to cause you sorrow and great sighing. Not that she's going to have children in pain. He doesn't cause her to have children in pain. And just assume that. Why? It doesn't say that, but because God does prophesy and say, Teladai Banim, you will birth sons. And what is going to be that sorrow and pain that she's going to have? Because God knew that one, he knew one was going to rise up and kill the other one. That's the sorrow and pain. And it's the one that tricked her that causes that. How does he cause that? Because he robbed them from having to be able to, he robbed her children from the ability to receive the life from the tree of life. Satan, because of what he tricked Eve into to believing his lie, he robbed her children from being able to partake from the tree of life. And sin came into the world, and it would cause her great sorrow and sighing because he knew that one child was going to kill the other because of sin was in the world. But it's even more than that. Then God says, Ve'el ishach, and to your husband, to shutecha, you will turn to him. Oh, but what do they translate that? They totally miss that one up. The Jews put on their shout, your craving be. And yet we have in early translations that it literally said, the earlier English or Greek translations, it was, you'll turn to him. Because why? We have shuk in there. Shuv is to turn around in Hebrew, to turn around. See, what was it? She had a direct relationship with God. She had fellowship with God Almighty. 
God had fellowship with her just as he had with Adam. He didn't, do you see anywhere where God comes up there and says, oh, so Eve, go get your husband and then I'll talk to you? No. And Christ came to set back in order that one-on-one -on -one relationship between him and his daughters and with his sons. But then it gets all perverted. So then they try to take this and they try to make this a law. And the whole thing is, is God is saying to her, you're going to turn to your husband. And then what does God say? And he will rule over you. Not a divine decree that God is giving her saying, oh, by the way, because you messed up, I'm going to put your husband in charge of you. No, God says to her, you're going to turn from me to him. And instead of him loving you like I have loved you, he's going to lord over you. And Jesus taught and Paul taught, don't lord over God's heritage. But you do it anyway. Because you just gobble down anything. And, and you know, understand, like Paul, at one time, I thought that these were literal words too. I would defend it to the death as well. But search out your own salvation with trembling and fear. These women are not in bondage. Let me give you another example here, and then we'll close. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let me first just read to you that last verse. That's the clincher for me. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, you have to really think about this for a moment. If Paul really wrote that she shall be saved in childbearing, he's blown the entire redemption process completely out of the water. Redemption is through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are saved because we believe on Him. Then, then John 3.16 is, is a lie. If, if what Paul says here, if this is really the correct translation, let me say it this way, if this is really the correct translation, you, he says to the women, you shall be saved in childbearing. Then John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He, that he sent His only uh, Son, that whosoever shall believe in Him shall be saved, is totally wrong. Whosoever shall believe on him shall be saved. Why didn't John say, except for you women, you need to birth children. What about a woman that's barren? You know, I, I do know there in biblical times, if a woman was barren, she really, it was a huge reproach for her. She hated it. But God never said they weren't saved. He didn't, he didn't say they weren't saved because they couldn't have children. So what did Paul say? Do you know Paul, that word actually, in Koine Greek, doesn't mean saved. It means safe. S-A-F-E. Safe in childbearing. Let's look at the whole chapter, though, and then we'll close. Paul says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, and intercession given thanks. Let me, let me drop down a little bit further. Let me go to verse 4. Um, Verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. By the way, that man is mankind. I think, uh, I, I'm not sure, I'd have to look at this in Greek, but I think that's anthropos, mankind, not just man. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and, to an, uh, and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and I lie not. I, I the teacher of the Gentiles in faith and, and verity. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, I, I don't have time to go into that particular verse there, but there's some issues there. I'll have to come back to that later because it'd take too much more time and I'm trying to close. But I'm going to hit the, to the points here. But which becometh women professing godliness, which is which good with good, excuse me, with good works. Let the woman, and by the way, that was singular in Greek. He actually says, let that woman learn in silence with all subjection. 
Mm. But I suffer not, I'm sorry, I need verse 12. But I suffer not, and it should say, that woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now remember, we're still not seeing the other part of the conversation that he's dealing with on Timothy here. But what's happening, if you go back to Acts, you find out there was a big uproar dealing with these people where he left Timothy at. And what was the problem? They were teaching the goddess of Diana, Artemis, the fertility goddess. And so there's, we don't get to see this, but somehow or another, Paul in Greek, he literally is speaking only about one woman. So in Greek, you can see it clearly, you know, and even here, it doesn't say let the women learn in silence, does it? Or to be in subjection. But I suffer, but you, you can easily pervert that though. But if you say, but I suffer, I suffer, uh, excuse me, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. He actually says in Greek, but I suffer not that woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Because there was a woman coming in causing a huge commotion over the doctrine of Diana. And by the way, anybody that knows anything about the historical side of where Timothy was at, knows that they believed in this doctrine of Diana, that believed that women were first created and that they were the ones enlightened and not men. And she no doubt was bringing this false doctrine in and they also believed they would go down and worship the God of fertility, which was Diana, Artemis, the, the, Artem, the God of Artemis there. And they believed that if they didn't, if they didn't have these sexual orgies and everything with this goddess and everything, that their wives would not be safe when they had childbirth. That's interesting, isn't it? For Adam was first formed, then Eve. See, he's correcting the doctrine that she brought in. Because their doctrine was Eve was first and then Adam. But he corrects it. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, but not saved, she shall be safe. Now, here's the funny thing. The word uh, in Greek, usurp, Right there, it says, uh, let me go back to where we're at there. Nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Authenteo. That usurping that she was doing in Greek means with violent behavior. It was in a violent manner. It's another reason why we know that when she came in, it wasn't just that she's trying to teach somebody. She came in violently. And that's exactly the way they did with that doctrine of Diana. In fact, when Paul went down there in the book of Acts, for two hours they were in an uproar. These women were. And he was having all kinds of trouble with them. It was very hard to break through to this group there. And uh, so anyway, the, you just have to understand. And by the way, I think it's in Acts chapter 19 is where you can follow that up at. But the, the, in one other one, let me just mention this. E even... Uh, where we read to, and I forget exactly where it's at, talking about the man, be, or God be, uh, uh, God is the head of Christ, Christ is the head of the man, and man is the head of the woman. And we take in English, and it's okay to use the word head there, but we take that, and men create what they call the headship doctrine. We are the head of the home. But in Greek, that word is kephale, and the word kephale means the source. And what was, what was Paul showing there? That God was the source. The invisible God was the source of Christ. And Christ was the source of Adam. And Adam was the source of what? Eve. Because she was in him. Christ was in God. Man, man Adam was in Christ. So, anyway. I've taken up so much of your time. I, I trust this is a blessing. I know it's been a long message. But let me just... Declare again, please look at that. Do you realize Galatians there? Um, it is a curse if you preach another gospel. And there is so much, so much evidence that God never suppressed women. In every single case that you can, that you can speak about, that, that, that you want to go and find, you'll find out that it was totally either mistranslated, 
perverted or something, but they were changing. Paul knew that, and that's what I wanted to bring to you. Paul knew, according to Galatians 1.8, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. He knew it was going to happen. And Paul was trying to get you out of the Pharisaic traditions. I've shared with you exactly the Talmudic law that this come from. Now you have it. Now you know where it come from. It did not come from the Word of God. I'm Stephen Benun with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. Shalom. Have a blessed weekend. Be in prayer for us. Uh, we certainly need you. We need your help and your support in this ministry. I thank God for what you are doing. Uh, we have a lot of traveling coming up. We'll also be coming to the United States uh, in May, and we are uh, organizing a conference. I think it's June 19th. It will be in Tampa, Florida. So if you're wanting to come and attend, uh, just keep that in mind. As soon as I can get that posted on our calendar, I will post that event and then get more information to you. But Tampa, Florida, and I think that's either June 19th or June 15th. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll confirm that. Um, Sister Lisa Tesh is, works, is working on that part with my wife. They're organizing the timing on that. Uh, so we'll be coming and speaking uh, with you there while we're in the United States. And then back home we have to go, back into Israel, and continue the fight, the fight uh, of faith there. So anyway, if you want to give, you can give online, israelreturns.com or israelinewslive.org, either place, there's a place you can donate there. And plus on our website, israelreturns.com, under the contact information there is our mailing address in the United States if you prefer to give uh, by mail. Thank you again and God bless you.